What's up guys, welcome back to the channel. Today we have a little bit of a special treat for you. This is our definitive sumo deadlift guide. Now we originally recorded this for Omar Esof's channel. He posted it on there about eight months ago and we've been meaning to get it up on our channel. I know we maybe have a lot of new subscribers and uh, we wanted to make sure that it was accessible for everybody who comes to the channel. So go ahead and check it out and let us know what you think in the comments below. teach each and every one of you to the best of my ability about the sumo deadlift and what I hope is going to be the most thorough and comprehensive guide out there on the tubes. I also want to give a huge thank you and shout out to Omar Issa for hosting this video on his channel and helping us get the stuff out there. First off, let's talk about the setup. In the setup, there's gonna be four main components you're gonna to wanna to take into consideration every time you approach the bar. Number one is gonna be your stance width, number two, your toe angle, number three is how wide you grip the barbell, and number four is gonna be the height of your hips. So when deciding your stance width, for most people, I would start off shins in line with the rings on the barbell. Uh, for some people, this is gonna be a little bit wide, for some a little bit narrow, but the biggest thing that you can do to help yourself find the stance width is to film your lift from the front and look for stacked joints. We wanna see the ankles right below the knees when you pull yourself into position. When trying to set the angle of your toes with your sumo deadlift, we generally wanna see the toes in the same angle as the knees. So if your toes are pointed out really far, we're gonna to have to be able to externally rotate to match that same angle from the knees. Another thing to keep in mind with your toe angle is gonna be that there's a bit of a balance trade-off. The more you toe out, the less balance you have forwards and backwards. When deciding how wide to grip the bar, be conscious of the fact that the wider you grip, the easier it's gonna to be to set your back, but also what goes hand in hand with that is gonna be dragging your hands over your quads on the way up and an increased range of motion. With a narrower grip, you're gonna trim that range of motion a little bit and you're probably not gonna to run to the issue of running your hands across your quads, but it may be tougher for you to get your back set and your lats engaged in your deadlift. The last and trickiest component of the setup is gonna be finding your ideal hip height. Now this one's tricky because it requires you to learn how to pull into tension and pull the slack out of the bar properly, but here's a couple of tricks you can use to try and set yourself up at the right hip height. One thing to look out for from a side angle is to try and keep your shins mostly vertical. If your shins are too far forward and your knees are too far in front of the barbell, that can result in a little bit too much of a squat pattern and a loss of power from the posterior chain. Another thing we wanna see from the side angle when you're at your ideal hip height is gonna be your shoulders set directly above the bar. Now that we've got the basics of the setup down, I wanna talk a little bit about exactly how you're gonna grip the bar. The best deadlift setup in the world isn't gonna do you any good if you can't hold on to the bar. And the two main ways we do that are the mix grip and the double overhand hook grip. A couple of the benefits to mix grip are that number one, it's easy to learn. You simply put one hand over and one hand under and away you go. Another thing is that it's not that painful when compared to something like the hook grip. The last thing is that it is quite strong. Uh, I was able to deadlift quite a bit this way without any issue. Some of the downsides are gonna be what's called the windmill effect. So because you have one hand over and one hand under, the bar spins ever so slightly as you lock out. The other big issue with mixed grip, and the reason I no longer do it, is what I lovingly call quad finger. Now this has happened to me a number of times in competition. It robbed me of my first two or three 800 plus pound deadlifts. And it's simply when your hands lock out directly over your quads and your quads open your hands up as you do so. The other increasingly popular way people grip the bar during a sumo deadlift is gonna be the double overhand hook grip. 
Now basically all you're doing is you're stuffing your thumb under the bar, grabbing on over top of the thumb, and using the thumb as a wedge to keep the bar from rolling anywhere. With hook grip, the potential downsides are that it hurts and it's tough to master. It takes most lifters a while to be able to use it successfully with max loads. The upsides though, are that you get no quad finger and no windmill when you're locking out. The bar stays the same distance from each thigh on both sides. Next up, a huge important part of a great sumo deadlift is gonna be bracing your trunk properly. One of the biggest and most important aspects of a good sumo deadlift is gonna be bracing. Now we do this in a couple of ways. We brace through the anterior and we brace through the posterior. The biggest cues I use for the anterior bracing are gonna to be to draw the ribs down on top of the abs and for the posterior is gonna to be to use your lats to extend your back. Now if you need practice with drawing your ribs down, there are a couple of movements that you can try. Now a lot of these have been prescribed by Dr. Stuart McGill. If you don't know about him, go check him out. But you're looking at bird dogs, McGill crunches, and side planks as good ways to reinforce solid bracing patterns. The lat's importance in stabilizing the spine while deadlifting cannot be overstated. There are huge muscles that run from your shoulder all the way down your back into your hips. When used properly, they can help you maintain spinal position and also keep the bar nice and close so it doesn't drift away while you're deadlifting. One of the cues I really like for teaching people to use their lats properly is to pinch your armpit shut and pull the bar into your shins. When you're doing this, you want to think about pulling your shoulders down, not back, because pulling your shoulders back will increase your range of motion. A good exercise for cueing some of this or learning what it feels like is straight bar pull downs. Another really important component of bracing yourself properly for the sumo deadlift is gonna be your low back and pelvic position. A slight lordosis or a slight little bit of extension in your low back is ideal. Flexion is a herniation mechanic, meaning that if your back goes from a slight extension past neutral into flexion, that puts you at risk for an injury. A good way to gain the awareness to feel when you're in a slight lordosis or slight flexion is gonna to be to do a cat-cow stretch previous to deadlifting to help you feel that out. All these components of proper bracing in the sumo deadlift are gonna make the distinction between finishing your deadlift with hip extension versus finishing your deadlift with back extension. Finishing with hip extension is gonna keep you further from injury, it's gonna be more powerful, and it's gonna be more efficient, while finishing with back extension is gonna be a potential injury mechanic, and it's gonna be slower and less efficient. I also wanna take a second to talk about the difference between being able to get into position and losing it versus not being able to get into position at all. If you can get into the position, but you lose it, you need to start treating your flat back deadlift as a different movement and count any rep where you lose position a missed rep. On the other hand, if you can't get into position, then you need to look at things like the cat-cow stretch and just practicing your setup so you can get into a better, more efficient deadlifting position. Next, we're gonna start getting down to the nitty gritty and we're gonna talk about how to pull the slack out of the bar. The next component of a really great sumo deadlift is gonna be properly pulling the slack out of the bar. Now, this is a term that gets thrown around a lot, but in some cases, it might leave you wondering, what the hell is pulling the slack out of the bar? Pulling the slack out of the bar effectively is gonna involve using your upper back and your lats to properly counterweight yourself against the bar to get that feeling of full body tension that in most cases, if the weight's light enough, is actually gonna make the bar float. One way you can tell that pulling the slack out of the bar has not been properly achieved is if you hear the bar click as you start to pull. As a bit of an aside, I think it's worth mentioning that it's definitely possible to have a really good sumo deadlift without pulling the slack out of the bar. An example of this is a guy named Kyler Woolham. He pulled 926 the other day and the guy just slams into the bar. For most people, especially early on and learning the sumo deadlift, I would recommend learning to pull the slack out of the bar because I think it's gonna give you a more consistent and more repeatable deadlift. I think when you get into the habit of kind of slamming into the bar like that, unless you're an expert like Kyler, it's gonna to lead to inconsistencies in positioning more often than not. Pulling the slack out of the bar can be effectively done two different ways. The first way is gonna be a top-down setup where you're setting your lat tension, you're setting your trunk tightness, and slowly reaching down to the bar, almost like an eccentric in a squat, uh, like a guy like Christoph Verspicki, who's another incredibly good puller. 
Uh, and then on the opposite side of that, you have what I do, which is a bottom-up setup. So you're gonna reach down, grab onto the bar, and then as you set yourself against the bar, you're setting your position as well. There's no real surefire way to tell whether a top-down or a bottom-up setup is gonna work better for you. So the best thing to do is just try each out, maybe for a full session each, and see which one produces a better, more comfortable, more repeatable and consistent deadlift. Now we're getting into the meat of it. The next thing we're gonna talk about is the lift itself. So for the purpose of this video and this tutorial, we're gonna break down the sumo deadlift execution into two phases of the lift. The first phase is gonna be the push off the floor, and the second phase is gonna be the hip extension through the lockout. Phase one of the sumo deadlift is all about making the lift a push off the floor. Now a lot of people get carried away with deadlifting thinking, well, it's called a pull, I'm just gonna pull on this bar really hard. That's not the ideal way to do it. Phase one of the sumo deadlift, I like to get people thinking about it like they're doing a leg press. You wanna maintain your hip angle, push the bar off the floor using your quads and try to stay nice and upright so that you have good leverage to follow through and finish in phase two. A couple of really important things to remember during this phase of the lift are number one, be patient off the floor. Don't rush it, because that's gonna lead to a loss of position. Number two, don't get psyched out if it feels heaviest off the floor. If you're staying in a good position off the floor, it's going to feel tougher. Number three, I don't know if I've mentioned this, but position, maintain position above all else. Once we've broken the bar off the floor and we've maintained position, we're ready to finish the lift, which is phase two. Phase two of the sumo deadlift is all about hip extension. Now, if you're confused about hip extension versus back extension, in terms of what we're doing in the lockout, go back to the bracing part where I talked about what an extended back is and why we need to keep it extended so we can finish the lift with our hips. In the transition to the lockout phase of the movement, there's something that a lot of people contest about, and that's early knee lock. Now, when you come past your knees with the bar, a lot of people will focus on really quickly locking their knees and then locking their hips to really separate the timing of the two things. Now, there are some distinct advantages to doing an early knee lock. The biggest of those being, it's gonna get your quads out of the way. If, like myself, your quads tend to get in the way. A disadvantage to that, however, is that if you don't hold enough tension in your lats and lock your knees too early or too hard, it can bobble the bar out in front of you, causing you to either lose balance or causing the bar to move downwards, which in a competitive powerlifting scenario can cause you a missed lift. So all that being said, personally, I don't really focus on early knee lock, but I do believe on most of my heavier lifts, it tends to happen just slightly in front of my finishing hip extension. In any case, the goal of the second phase of the sumo deadlift is to keep the bar nice and close to the body, don't lose lat tension, and don't lose that back extension while finishing the lift by extending your hips. One last thing I wanna mention, a bit of a bad habit that some people have is when they finish the lift, they'll either shrug their shoulders up or pull their shoulders back too much. Ideally, like we talked about in bracing, we're pinching that armpit shut, shoulders are depressed, and we're maintaining that position as we finish the lift. I hope that this video has offered everybody who's watched it something, whether you're a novice or an intermediate lifter, just learning to sumo deadlift for the first time, or whether you've been doing it for a couple years. I really hope that this video has given you something to take away, uh, and that it helps you put kilos on your total, stay further away from injury. If you guys liked the video, be sure to head over to our YouTube channel, Calgary Barbell, and another huge thank you and shout out to Omar Issa for hosting this video on his channel.